This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. The holiday season is a time we all want to enjoy. Maybe that means indulging in more food than usual, buying those special gifts and treats for loved ones, and going all out with decorations in your home. But with all that indulgence comes a lot of waste. Household waste increases by more than 25% from Thanksgiving to New Year's. That's according to Stanford University's Waste Reduction, Recycling, Composting, and Solid Waste Program. This comes from various sources, including wrapping paper, Christmas trees, and even food waste. Do you still have leftovers from Thanksgiving? I actually still do. I'm uh, working my way through them, but rest assured, nothing, and I mean nothing, is going to waste. Experts say there are easy ways to reduce your carbon footprint and have a greener holiday season. And today, we talk about ways to reduce holiday waste. And joining us now is a familiar where we live voice you've probably heard on the show before is Mariah Kelly. He's, she's an assistant professor of environmental science at Southern Connecticut State University. Welcome to the show. Hi, everyone, and happy holidays. Happy holidays to you. Joy to be back. Absolutely. And for our listeners, let us know if you have any questions. Give us a call, 888-720-9677, or leave us a comment on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. So, Mariah, I want to start by asking, you know, what do we know about holiday waste and how much it increases during the holiday? So, obviously, you know, if you're living in an American society today, you know that the holiday time is one of a lot of waste. Um, and across the board, as you mentioned, you know, it comes in the form of packaging. Um, and now that many people are relying on e-commerce, extra packaging, um, you know, it comes in the form of food waste and sort of overindulgences that people tend to have around this time of year. Of course, everybody gets jazzed up about their holiday lights and their Christmas decorations, but all of that requires energy um, and in many ways is um, a problem for uh, climate change and uh, fossil fuel use. Um, holiday decor can be full of plastics and um, obviously, as I've talked on this show before, um, has become a major issue for water and waterways. Um, and because I do a lot with the ocean, you know, thinking about, you know, what we put um, in the freshwater system that ends up in our ocean is really important. And then the last thing that I would say um, is that around the holidays, we do a lot of wasting our human energy. Um, and by that, I mean, we do a lot of sort of stressing out about things that, um, you know, quite frankly, don't really matter a whole lot in the larger scheme of things. And so right now, you know, as we think about, you know, what does it mean to be sustainable or do right by people and planet during this holiday season, um, think about your own individual energy and bringing, you know, your positive energy into the world and letting your energy um, shine this holiday season. That's such a great point because I think everything is so interconnected. You know, we're talking about like physical energy, but also human energy, which contributes. It's the cycle, right, that we're, I think we're trying to break here. And, and we definitely want to get into more details about food waste and also e-commerce. But you mentioned, you know, the wanting to decorate your house and, and we all kind of get into it during the season. You know, it can be really tempting, right, when you're at the Target or at the Marshalls and you want to buy a whole new set of Christmas ornaments. So can you talk about sort of that process? Because I think you've also talked about how social media plays a huge part in that. Yeah, so it's sort of become a trend on social media that people decorate their Christmas trees in really lavish and extravagant ways. Um, you know, we all can't be uh, the window at Macy's <laughs> and be sustainable. <laughs> um, so, you know, th but there's so much you can do to make your space beautiful and decorate and do it in an environmental way. Um, and so, you know, the things that are going to be helpful are to buy, you know, durable goods, things that are glass, that are metal, things that are going to last a really long time that, you know, I'm fortunate to have a, a, a Christmas tree that's full of ornaments that were passed down from generations to generations. And, you know, it brings me a lot of joy to see my great grandmother's uh, Christmas ornaments on my tree each year. Um, but, you know, it's always nice to get new things each year, too. So I always, you know, I give our, we like to have a little bit of grace and buy something new, but make it something that's going to last and not necessarily be made out of plastic. Um, there's a big rise in these plastic bulbs, and obviously that's a, a problem for plastic use in general. Do you have any additional advice in terms of 
like better ways or smarter ways to buy decorations or get decorations? Oh, we love, um, I one, buy decorations year round and you can find decorations year round and craft shops. And even when I'm, you know, at a museum or in a bookstore, I'll look around and find decorations that I just that speak to me that are meaningful. Um, and I often give uh, little decorations to people as gifts from places that I travel around the world as, as I'm lucky to do that. Um, and so, you know, you can pick up secondhand gift um, uh, ideas like um, ornaments and things from, you know, secondhand stores. You can also craft them yourself. And, and you know, I have an eight-year-old daughter. Shout out to Stella. Um, she's the craftiest person I know. And so we love, like, making things and just decorating our tree together, which makes it a lot more meaningful. Um, I was actually, as you were describing, I was just thinking, so I have a, a finger puppet that's Sherlock Holmes that usually finds its way on top of my Christmas tree. <laughs> so FYI for those fellow nerds, uh, that's an idea for a, for a star, rather than a plastic star, you got a little <laughs> finger puppet. He's not very pleased about it, but he has to deal with it. Um, but we have to ask you a very painful subject, which is glitter. Mm. So yeah. what about for those who love glitter, what can we do? All right, whoever's managing the email system right now, get ready, because this is a hot topic, right? Okay, here we go. I love sparkle, and people who know me know I love some sparkle. Um, but the reality is loose glitter is really, really bad for the environment in so many ways. Um, and many people don't even realize that some of that loose glitter, they're actually bioaccumulating into their bodies over time. Um, it gets into our waterways, which ends up in our oceans. Um, it's really difficult to, to clean and get off. So if you have something that's, you know, uh, you know, sparkling outwards, you probably want to think about it because it's just putting loose glitter into the world, which is a major problem. Um, so, you know, you got to glitter responsibly now. <laughs> we know better. <laughs> and um, there are lots of ways to sparkle responsibly. Uh, you know, look again to natural materials. There's actually um, glitter made out of mica, which is a mineral, right? Um, there's uh, you know, crystals and things like that that you can use to bring that sparkle in the way that we all need some sparkle without it having to be loose, loose glitter. <laughs> oh, I'm going to need someone out there who can make this in a very responsible and sustainable manner is glitter responsibly. Yeah. I mean, that's, the, <laughs> yeah. that's the new thing to do, everyone. <laughs> and so we have another controversial subject coming up naturally um, in this conversation is Christmas trees. Mm. So uh, I know a lot of people that uh, buy plastic trees because they're thinking, well, we're not buying new trees every year, so we can use the plastic tree over and over again. Is that actually a good way to go, or would you suggest otherwise? I believe in the hand-cut, local, natural Christmas tree, um, and for lots of reasons. And one, you know, we live in Connecticut. We live in a climate where um, pine and fir trees are abundant and can grow without a lot of extra input into the environment. Um, and uh, the other thing is that you have to look at the entire life cycle of the tree. Um, you know, if you have a natural tree, that tree is going to eventually biodegrade into the ground if disposed of properly. And there's lots of ways you could do that. Um, but if you have a plastic tree or, you know, a fake tree, which is likely to be made out of plastic because... Honestly, the the really expensive ones that are made out of uh, that are made out of recycled goods are un unattainable to a lot of people. So many of the trees that are attainable from the price point are plastic, and they're made out of you know highly chemicalized materials. And so when those things get disposed of, they eventually get into the environment. Um, and so, you know, also you have to think about when you are buying a local Christmas tree, um, and there are many local Christmas tree farms around the state, um, you're contributing to the local economy. Um, our Christmas tree farm, um, shout out to Peaceful Hill, uh, is a multi-generational family farm, and we support their business because it's, you know, great for our community and great for the environment as well. 
So support your local tree farm. So you get a fresh tree. So after that, how would you advise listeners go about recycling their Christmas trees? Yeah. So there, one first check to see if your town or municipality has a tree pickup program. Um, for those of you who can bring it to a transfer station, many towns, if you don't have a pickup program, you can bring it to a transfer station if you don't have the land or a place to put it. Um, I do have a little bit of property at my house, so if you do, you can um, put the tree in the woods. Um, you can also cut it up into smaller pieces and, and put it in the woods. Eventually, that will biodegrade down. It also becomes really good habitat for, for nature. Um, and, you know, we sometimes place the tree on or near a stream bed that becomes um, habitat for fish or other wildlife throughout the winter. Um, and then, you know, for those of us who have the space to do so as well, um, many towns, depending on where you live, will allow you to have a small brush fire. And so in the spring, when we're doing our winter cleanup, we will sometimes just take our old tree and, and burn it up with the rest of the brush. And of course, always check the fire danger in your area, clear the area of any debris and um, fire your Christmas tree responsibly. That's another bumper sticker that we need, clearly. <laughs> and, and so you mentioned e-commerce earlier. So you know, this week we had Cyber Monday. Last week was Black Friday, which means a lot of online shopping. So how does that impact holiday waste? And because long, online shopping really makes it easy to, oh, let me buy the thing. Oh, I'm not really into it. Let me return it. Does mm. that make a huge impact? Oh, yes, it does. Because think about this. If you buy that item, it takes all those fossil fuels to get that item to your door and all the packaging included. And then you decide to not use it. And so then you have all those fossil fuels to then return it back. Um, and so you're basically making double the waste by buying extra things and then returning them later in that way. Um, so, you know, there's a lot you could do to just buy less. <laughs> Um, and just focus on um, things maybe that are more meaningful. And so, you know, I always recommend doing things outside the box a little bit. Um, you know, the experience gifts or, you know, there's so many great things about our state, things to do and um, things that people don't necessarily do for themselves that they would love if you gifted it to them. Um, so we love experience gifts. Um, you know, you can also... Uh, do things like um, going in on a gift with a bunch of friends so that you're buying something that maybe is a bigger, more durable thing that is going to be actually really valuable to that person, um, but maybe wouldn't have been affordable if, if one person had to purchase it. So going in on something that you know that that person wants and needs. And so I, I love that because you know what you're just describing, uh, it's not only less physical objects, it's also buying less, but you also, you don't need to wrap up an experience in wrapping paper, right? Which is the next controversial subject we have is another big culprit of, of waste is wrapping paper, which can't be recycled. Mm -hmm. So what are some alternatives for those who still want to, you know, package up their gifts? Because it's, it's really pretty, it's really cute, it's, it's, a, it's a really creative and fun way to, to give a gift. So what, what kind of advice do you have for listeners who still want to do that? Um, so a couple of things. One, I personally use like a brown recycled paper and uh, and like a hemp string. And then oftentimes around Christmas or the holidays, I'll go foraging for or I'll use little um, sprigs that I find of winterberry or pine and I'll put it in there um, to make it. So you can make these things really beautiful and out of natural materials uh, when it comes to wrapping. Um, and also, you know, I am totally guilty of saving the gift bag and re-gifting the gift bag. And I actually have some gift bags that I just absolutely love. And um, funny enough, actually, um, my friend and I basically keep giving each other the same gift bag back and forth because we really lo both love it. And one of us will end up with it eventually. But, um, you know, you can use re reuse that. And then there's also things like um, fabric wrapping paper or, you know, maybe wrapping something in a small blanket or something that could be used. Um, there's so many creative ways to think about um, giving something um, that doesn't require especially glitter wrapping paper. 
And you know what? <laughs> you know, you're talking about exchanging the or regifting the gift bag. That's actually an experience in of itself, right? You're actually putting some memories into that bag. I really, I really love that idea. Uh, so, I mean, I love that you mentioned fabric too, because our senior producer Lily Tyson for the Colin McEnroe Show, shout out to Lily. Uh, she shared that my brother started giving gifts wrapped in fabric. So now I have some fabric, and I can wrap gifts in this year. And our colleague Claire Piazza shared that typically my partner and I will wrap our gifts in brown paper bags we save from grocery stores and the co-op, and we'll draw decorations on them. That is a super fun idea if you're a doodler like myself. Um, And our interim director of storytelling, Meg Dalton, also shared, I always use old newspapers and magazines to wrap presents, both for Christmas, but also birthdays, weddings, etc. Nat Geo especially makes for a lovely gift wrap. I appreciate that very specific shout out to Nat Geo. And so, so Mariah, as we were talking about sort of balancing, enjoying the holidays and being mindful about being wasteful, you know, how do we do the balance? How do we make that balance? Um, you know, I think this all begins with expecting less and wanting less and focusing on the things that really matter. You know, obviously there's a lot going on in the world right now and, you know, there's a lot to care about. And so I think everybody, you know, this time of year needs to just um, give give each other grace and consideration and empathy uh, because I think we put a lot of emphasis on gift giving and gift buying and having the perfect things Um, But when you look at it from the bigger picture, what really matters is, you know, for many of us being around the people we love and spending time together and celebrating the fact that we have the ability to do that still. Today, we're talking about going green this holiday season. Mariah Kelly, she's an assistant professor of environmental science from Southern Connecticut State University, will be staying with us. And up next, we want to hear from you. What tips do you have to reduce the holiday waste? Let us know. Senior producer Tess Terrible says, Growing up, my Nana would save every scrap of wrapping paper and paper tissue. At our family Christmas, she would gather every reusable piece she could find, and I honor her memory by trying to do the same every season. Thank you so much, Tess, for sharing that amazing story. And for our listeners, you can also join the conversation, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. Today, we're talking about ways to reduce trash and waste during the holiday season. It's it's been reported that an additional 1 million tons of trash enter landfills at the end of the holiday season. And one of the biggest sources of this trash is food waste. And joining us now is Brittany Cavallari from Connecticut Food Share. Welcome, Brittany, to our show this morning. Hey, Catherine. So great to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. And a quick note to our listeners that Connecticut Public recently partnered with the organization during its recent pledge drive. And also, if you have any tips to reduce food waste, let us know. Join the conversation, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. So before we get into food waste, Brittany, can you describe to our listeners what the Connecticut Food Share looks like around the holidays? Yeah, I, I would especially love to level set with listeners who might not be familiar with Connecticut Food Share at all and let everybody know, you know, Connecticut Food Share is the food bank serving the people of Connecticut. We work with a network of more than 500 community based uh, food assistance programs across the state. So think your food pantries, meal programs, emergency shelters, and we also run a mobile pantry program uh, partnering with more than 100 additional community-based organizations across the state. Uh, Last year, we distributed over 40 million meals to people um, experiencing food insecurity. And in Connecticut, you know, that number is nearly 400,000 residents, and that includes one in nine children. And when we think about food insecurity, I I want folks to understand that food insecurity is more than just not having enough food. The USDA actually defines food insecurity as the state of being without reliable access to a sufficient quantity of affordable, nutritious food. So it's both about access and affordability to that nutritious food. 
Um, at the holidays, you know, we're particularly busy. We run, we just finished up our, our annual Thanksgiving for our all campaign. Um, that's re- our annual tradition of raising food and funds um, to ensure that our neighbors have a Thanksgiving meal, but also to support our work year round because food insecurity does not only happen at the holidays. Quite frankly, uh, summer is the time when uh, food insecurity has a, is at its highest in the state with kids are out of school and often oftentimes um, kids are getting two or three free meals at school. So um, it's really an important time of year, but also recognizing that food insecurity is year round. Um, and so just not not at the holidays, but we thank everyone who is incredibly generous uh, during the holiday season because that helps fuel our work year round too. And so as we continue to think more about access and affordability, and also this is not just something you can do in the, during the holidays, but also something to think about year round, you know, what are some of those things that you want people to be mindful of when they donate? Yeah, definitely. So we oftentimes say your financial contributions will go a lot further than uh, a can of um, mixed vegetables, for example. We have Um, We are able to buy in bulk and we have access to Feeding America's bulk purchasing power. Um, So every dollar that we receive can help provide two meals, uh, which is huge and really helps fuel our work. But if folks uh, are really focusing on um, donating food to either directly to the food bank or to uh, a local pantry in your area, um, we're really looking for non-perishable items, not just holiday foods either, but those staples that Neighbors can use year round. So think, you know, tuna, canned tuna, macaroni and cheese, peanut butter, cooking oil. Um, That those are really helpful things to keep in mind as people are donating. And so we've also had conversations about food insecurities on the show and and inflation was also a part of that. So can you talk about how that has impacted needs at food pantries? Definitely. So. Food insecurity doesn't happen in a bubble, right? It's It doesn't happen just by itself. It's really more of a symptom of much deeper root causes in our country and here in our state. So think income inequities, um, lack of access to affordable housing or affordable health care, affordable child care, low wages, un, un, underemployment, um, and high costs of living. These things all influence food insecurity. And today we know that more people are doing dealing with food insecurity. And those who were already um, struggling are in many cases experiencing a deeper need as a result, not only of inflation, but the the high cost of living in in our state. Um, Just about a month ago, the USDA released food insecurity data uh, for the country for 2022, so about a year ago. And in that data, they said nationally, food insecurity has increased 30% since 2021 and 40% for children. It's the largest one-year increase um, since 2008, the first year of the Great Recession. And part of this is the result of the end of COVID era uh, government supports. And part of this is the result of inflation and this high um, cost of living. And I'll give one more example that um, the United Way every few years publishes their ALICE report. ALICE stands for Asset Limited, Income Constrained, Employed. Um, And these are folks who um, are working to make ends meet, and they're working, and they're working really hard. And it's about 28% of the population here in Connecticut. And the United Way said, um, currently, to get by a family of four in the state of Connecticut, Connecticut that has an infant and a preschooler has to make over $100,000 a year just to get by. This doesn't include things like savings or car repairs. It's just our our necessary um, expenses to get by. And so as we're seeing cost of of living rise in Connecticut, um, we are starting to see at our mobile sites a night we from this past October compared to October 2022, a 19% increase um, in number of people coming to our sites. And we're hearing from partner programs that have been around for 30, 40, 50 years. Then the past few months, they've served more people than ever in their history. Well, and so with that in mind, and, and those were all conversations that we've had on our food insecurity right. show. and. And, you know, th- with thinking about that, and we've been talking about different kinds of holiday waste, and we want to get into food waste. So can you give us an idea of what's happening there? Because so much food does go to waste when so many people are without it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll tell you, we have a really strong retail rescue program here at the food bank um, that actually brought in about 12 million pounds of food um, last year. And our retail rescue program, we partner with local grocery stores, think Stop and Shop, Big Y, ShopRite, and many, many more um, to distribute food that's, you know, nearing its best by date or nearing its sell by date, but is still safe and good to eat. Getting that food connected directly with um, local pantries so the food can be distributed quite quickly. Um, that being said, about two thirds of the food we receive is donated, much of it through the food industry, because um, the food industry does have the ability um, to uh, claim the uh, tax deductions for each of those donations. And we have volunteers here on site um, basically every day who are uh, working to ensure food safety and actually sorting the food that comes in and food that's no longer safe to distribute um, we're able to parse it out so that some of it goes to a pig farmer that we partner with, and some of it goes to a biofuel company, um, which we actually pay for that expense of waste. Um, I think the important thing here, though, to think about, Catherine, and for our listeners is, you know, we're often bombarded with images of, of the holidays on TV and in movies that show, you know, abundance and excess, as, as Mariah was talking about a little bit. And I would really urge listeners that, as you're thinking about avoiding holiday waste, um, consider shifting some of the money you might spend on your holiday meal or on gifts towards a donation to, to not certainly Connecticut Food Share if you're if you believe in our mission, and if not, to another organization um, whose mission you believe in. You can think of gift giving differently, maybe even like giving a donation in, in a loved one's name or that that idea that Mariah had about experience gifts. What about the experience of time together volunteering at a local nonprofit like Connecticut Food Share? And so earlier we had talked about getting a real tree and recycling it. You can bring it back to the earth. So our senior project manager for talk and storytelling, uh, Megan Fitzgerald, says, I use a compost service called Blue Earth mm -hmm. for my food waste. To me, paying to keep it out of the landfill and going back into the soil is so very worth paying for it. At our large family gatherings, we've gone to potluck si signups, mostly appetizers and desserts, and tried to eliminate having massive quantities of food and food waste by trying to be more conscious of how much we're making and bringing in. You can also encourage friends to bring their own take-home containers. That way, if there are leftovers, everyone has a chance to take something home and for it to actually be consumed instead of ending up in the garbage. That is a great idea, Meg. Thanks so much for that tip. And uh, using that as a reminder for our listeners that if you have a tip on reducing holiday waste, let us know, 888-720-9677, or leave us a comment on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. And now we're going to take a quick call from Dan, who is calling in from East Handon. Dan, you are on the line. Hello. Um, I would like to know what to say to my friends who um, don't reduce their food waste at restaurants. They don't take their leftovers home. They leave quite a lot behind sometimes. And also um, what to say to them to figure out how to compost their food waste at home because they live in the city. I live in a rural town, East Haddam, and I find it's easier to um, compost my food waste than not to here, actually. Well, thank you so much for that question, Dan. So, Mariah, would love for you to uh, to respond to that in a language to what to tell your friends when you need them to take home some of that extra food or to compost. Um, one of the best ways to sort of uh, not so it's not so much about convincing people; it's about understanding why they are not doing that and and trying to figure out what are the barriers to them actually um, consuming that food in in the way that we would hope them to. And then try to work with them to limit those barriers. And maybe it means, um, you know, when you're going out to eat with them that you bring your own uh, food container from home because you know they're going to not take their leftovers. Um, but certainly, definitely in terms of restaurant food, um, making sure that you're not leaving food on those plates because it's certainly just going to go in the garbage if you leave it there. Um, so, yes, eating at restaurants responsibly. And then... Um, you know, in terms of home compost and options for composting, now that we have the internet, there are so many different resources. Ev there's composting for everybody, no matter where you live and how you live. 
Um, and so I do compost at home. Everybody kind of has their own system that works for them. And sometimes it takes a little time to figure that out. But um, once you do, it can actually be a, a great move to, um, you know, then help with your garden in the spring. Um, and it does really cut down on generally having to take out the garbage. That's always a great idea. And I, I think with the holidays, especially with holiday foods, we love leftovers, right? But Mariah, do you have any tips on ways to eat mind portion control? Actually, that could be a part of a way to sort of prevent food waste. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things these days is that people have gotten really into food and cooking. And especially during COVID, there was this emergence of interest in cooking and I think that one of the best ways for portion control is to actually use an older, more traditional cookbook, The Joy of Cooking, the Betty Crocker cookbook. I find that many of the recipes that are listed online after you have to read about their entire life story of, of how they made that recipe um, – they often have much larger portions than what you will find in a more traditional old school cookbook. And also in those cookbooks, you will find information about portions and information about measuring and counting who are your guests and, and that kind of thing. So using old school cookbooks. I'm also a big fan of the potluck because if your family's anything like mine, people have preferences and what they want to eat. Um, and so one of the best ways to ensure everybody has something to eat is, that they like is to have everybody bring a dish that they prefer. But it also cuts down on food waste at the end of the day because then that one person who hosted isn't left with all of the leftovers. Instead, everybody ends up taking home the food that they know they like to eat. And so, um, you know, it really can cut down on food waste. It makes for a much more communal and less stressful experience, too. I think less stressful is a key point to this conversation. <laughs> Our colleague, uh, Corey Princell from the New England News Collaborative, shared that part of reducing food waste for me is keeping the bones and making broth for soups. It's one of my favorite parts of having big meals with a turkey, lamb, or other bone and roast. Yes, Corey, I am so into this. I actually just finished my last bowl of turkey soup, and I'm very, very sad right now. So, But, Brittany, you know, as we talk about food waste, holiday waste, and we mentioned food insecurity as well, can we talk about if there is still stigma or is there shame that goes along with food insecurity? Sure. I would say there's a perception of stigma, perhaps a perception of shame. Um, and we all know that classic motto, right? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But I find that motto to be quite problematic in that it assumes everyone has the same resources and opportunities to do so. But I would love for our listeners to think about, you know, food deserts, places where neighborhoods where People don't have easy access or reliable access, quite frankly, to affordable, nutritious food. It's very difficult to pull yourself up by your bootstraps when you don't even have access to those opportunities, right? And so it's it's really important for us um, at Connecticut Food Share, along with the network of 500 community-based food assistance programs we're working with, to really ensure that the experience of seeking and obtaining food assistance is dignified, supportive, and convenient and that people have as much choice as possible so that they can meet their dietary needs and also cultural cultural preferences and other food preferences. We want to make it easier for people to ask for help to overcome that perception of shame or stigma because we know that families, most families, right, don't have necessarily a fixed food cost each month. Food is that, that expense is usually flexible, but expenses like our housing costs, electricity, um, you know, all the things we need, just our car payments, let's say, um, do have fixed costs and oftentimes they're pretty expensive. Food often becomes the trade-off for those things, right? Hence the rise in food insecurity right now as the cost of living rises. And so we want to make it easier for folks to ask for help when they need it and make sure that those resources are as easy to find and as accessible as possible. So while I have a moment, Catherine, if I might, if any of our listeners might be looking for some assistance with food at this holiday season or any time during the year, please call 211 or visit our website, ctfoodshare.org slash find help. The more that we can uh, normalize 
um, food insecurity and a need and um, how to find help. The And the more awareness we can bring, um, the easier it will be for folks to ask for help when they need it. And as we speak, uh, spread our awareness to normalize the asking for help. You know, I have a final question here for you, Brittany. We talked about sort of how this is not something to just address one, once a year. So about post-holidays, I imagine you get a lot of support during the holidays. You know, what do you want people to keep in mind after after the holidays? You know, to, yeah, to, I can't, to I can't yeah. stress enough. Our work doesn't just happen at the holidays. Food insecurity doesn't just happen at the holidays. Food insecurity is year-round. Um who is food insecure might change from month to month or year to year, um, but food insecurity doesn't stop and our work doesn't stop when the holidays end. And so all the things I mentioned before about ways to get involved and ways to contribute, whether it's, you know, making a financial donation or volunteering with us, there's many different volunteer opportunities. We are a statewide organization. We have three locations, our headquarters in Wallingford and satellite sites and uh, Bloomfield and Bridgeport, um, where we always have volunteer um, shifts available. Our mobile program at more than 100 sites, always looking for volunteers, along with the local 500 community-based food assistance programs who rely on volunteers. If you have the time um, to share, please, please do. It's not only a humbling experience, but it's really creates, helps create community. Brittany Cavallari, she's a Senior Director of Strategy at Connecticut Food Share. Thank you so much for being on our show today. Thank you so much. And happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays to you, Brittany. And Mariah Kelly, who is from Southern Connecticut State University, will be staying with us. Today, we're talking about going green this holiday season. So if you have any tips and tricks to reducing waste, let us know, 888-720-9677, or leave us a comment on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Our colleague Megan Boone shared with us that I think there's a real connection to the unavoidable conservation habits people developed during World War II and the Great Recession. My grandmother went through both, and she never met a bread or brown bag, twist tie, leftover, or bit of tin foil that wasn't saved or reused for another time or ten. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Megan. And coming up next, we hear ways to find environmentally friendly gifts. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. Reducing your carbon footprint doesn't mean you can't still enjoy the holidays. Choosing meaningful gifts and shopping locally is a great way to start to go greener. And joining us now in studio is Yasmin Ugerlu. She's the founder and owner of Reboot Ego, a zero-waste shop in Middletown, Connecticut. Welcome back to the show, Yasmin. Hi. Thanks for having me again, and thanks for having this really important conversation. No, we're super excited, and we still have Mariah Kelly also with us from a Southern Connecticut State University. So I want to jump straight to you, Yasmin. How is your shop getting ready for the holidays? Well, the biggest thing that we're doing really is having the conversations and letting people know, just like Mariah said, just, you know, chill out, focus on what's important, don't stress, don't get overwhelmed trying, you know, too hard to do better, it, trying to make it as easy, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for folks to be able to make better decisions and demonstrating how easy and affordable it can be and in some cases even free. You know, Mariah uh, made a lot of great points around ways that you can just use what you already have or, you know, buy something once and reuse it over and over and over, like, uh, you know, I, like a gift bag or reusable uh, gift wrap, which is what we, we offer in the store. And um, you know, I can also say that between, you know, friends and family members, we bought that reusable gift wrap once and it goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And it does. It turns it, like you said, Catherine, into an experience, you know, that alone also adds a lot of uh, wonderful flair uh, to, uh, to the experience of gift giving. Uh, and we like to be able to offer all kinds of locally made products. Our, our store is 100% uh, small businesses. Uh, it's all the products we have. Uh, are, many of them are made in Connecticut uh, or are uh, created by Connecticut companies. Uh, they are all, you know, plastic free, non-toxic. So allowing folks to kind of give something that is uh, practically, you know, applicable in their lives. So it's not just something that they can kind of look at once or twice and then put to the side, but it's something that they can actually incorporate into their lives so they can think of the gift giver, you know, over and over again. Uh, but also demonstrating that uh, there are ways that you can just you know, use what you already have. So. 
And so give us an idea what do people come in looking for? You know, can, can you tell us some of the things that you brought into the studio today? Okay, sure, sure. So I show uh, and tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, I brought so one of the most popular items, especially already uh, so far, is Swedish dishcloths. Uh, so Swedish dishcloths, for those who don't know, are basically the replacement for sponges and paper towels, and they're just kind of an all-purpose uh, tool in the kitchen and around the house. Um, they are made from wood pulp, just wood pulp, and uh, so they biodegrade in literally any environment. You can throw it in your backyard, you can throw it in the compost, you can put it. If it goes into the landfill, it will biodegrade very quickly. Um, but it also lasts a really long time, which seems, you know, counterintuitive. Uh, so the company that we use is uh, Three Bluebirds, which is a Connecticut company. Uh, so we're very excited to, you know, support local in, in that regard. But they also come in lots of fun designs. So they come in all kinds of fun designs for year-round, but we offer a lot of seasonal ones. So they make a great gift. They're fun to use. You know, they're, they're, kind of, they're fun to look at around the kitchen and such. Uh, so that's one of the items that's really popular. Um, one of the items uh, that we also have things like dryer balls. None of those I brought with me today, but dryer balls are really fun. We've got fun designed ones. So um, dryer balls are great at reducing drying time, at uh, uh, reducing static cling, and basically they replace uh, dryer sheets, which are have a lot of microplastics in them. Uh, but they're a lot of fun, and again, it's something that you can use for years and years and years and years. But then there's more seasonal items as well. So things like we have uh, a wildflower seed paper uh, greeting cards. So greeting cards that you can give, but then that don't have to just, you know, you accumulate them for a little bit, you look at them for a little bit, but then uh, then they just kind of go into a pile or they go into the garbage. So having uh, wildflower, you know, seed paper uh, gift cards um, is a really great way of being able to gift something that then can turn into something that people look at for a really long time. Uh, one of the items I also brought is uh, a, a reusable sandwich bag um, in a really fun design. These are not only is it something that can be used you know, over and over, and that's just something that we carry year-round. It's also a Connecticut company. Shout out to the Greener Gift out of Manchester, Connecticut, who makes all of our fabric items. So this is a fold-over sandwich bag, but we also um, they also make um, reusable uh, uh, gift wrap, which is what we also like to carry. So gift bags, gift wrap, all kinds of different things. But the sandwich bag can be a gift bag, right? Right? So this can then be a way that not only are you wrapping, you know, a, a gift in it, and then we've got all different kinds of designs. So you can really personalize it for the pe- person you're giving it to, to then allow them to use it over and over, not just when they're giving a gift, but when they're, you know, wrapping their their lunch and such. So then, and then all kinds of just, you know, personal use or, or household item use. So like there's face and body soaps made in New York, and all kinds of, um, you know, things like a reusable container of uh, hand soap that can be refilled at our shop. So demonstrating not only what exists and that alternatives exist, but also uh, giving an example of, hey, environmentally friendly things are cool, useful, you know, practical and make great gifts. Well, you've already made me feel so much better and cooler about myself because I do use a Swedish dish cloth. And it's amazing. <laughs> and I um, also love a sandwich bag that's reusable yes. and it's adorable and cute. So, But you're having a holiday swap party, which yes. sounds like a really cool thing. Can you tell us what's happening there? What does that mean? Absolutely. So per what Mariah was saying earlier about you know the decor items and um, decor can really incorporate a lot of plastic and it can get expensive and there's pressure. Uh, just like what Mariah said, there's a pressure to kind of you know create this Macy's, you know, level uh, uh, or, you know, Nordstrom's level, you know, a design display. So and and often we don't need all the things that we have. We acquire, we maybe use it once or, you know, or twice and then it just kind of stays. So we have a swap party, um, uh, which is, you know, something that we do pretty regularly. Uh, We have a swap party. This is our third year of doing a holiday decor item swap party. So tomorrow uh, from 10 to 1 at the DeCoven House in Middletown, because our swap studio is now too, too full, so we didn't have room to have it there. But we're partnering with the Rockfall Foundation to uh, hold it at the Coven House Uh, And it's all around decor items. So in past years, we've had things like tree stands, Christmas tree stands. We've had garlands, uh, the 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 fake you know garlands, fake mini trees, uh, lots of ornaments, lots of you know uh, porcelain items. And since I since I mentioned and since uh, Mariah made a great point about real trees versus the fake. But if they exist, if you've already bought one, like me seven years ago when I didn't know any better, when you bought one, keep it, keep it well, store it carefully, let it last as long as possible, give it the longest life possible. And then if and when you don't want it anymore, give it to someone else, right? At least give it a long life that at least someone makes up for the carbon footprint, right? That at least someone makes up for then, you know, the resources that went into making it, the longer, the more use you get out of it. And then dispose responsibly, right? It's tougher. It's a lot harder to dispose of that fake tree, but there are ways 
look at your municipality, look statewide, do a little Google search, reach out to us, we'll help you, you know, just dispose responsibly. But if you're going to buy it, maybe, you know, there's a lot of reasons not to buy a real tree, right, even though that might be uh, the optimal choice. Maybe it's just it's just too difficult. Maybe you don't have a way to transport it. Maybe you have allergies, right? There are reasons. Maybe, you know, if you're in Connecticut, we don't necessarily have these problems yet. But if water is a, you know, is a really hard, you know, thing to come around, they, they require a lot of water. Uh, so in other states, that might be an issue. So then get it secondhand. Get that fake tree secondhand or do like I do. Decorate your houseplants. You don't need to have a tree. Don't, you know, That's don't feel pressured point. to have a tree. <laughs> right. Just because everyone else has one, decorate your houseplants. I, my houseplants get happy. <laughs> happy houseplants. Yeah. That's, a, that's a whole new thing and a different thing. Um, so dispose responsibly and glitter responsibly, people, yes. is, is the, are the themes today. But uh, we only have a couple minutes here left. But Mariah, I want to do. I do want to ask you. We've been talking about shopping locally, and I mean, Yasmin just made a great list of all of the local shops that her shop um, includes. So, can you talk about how shopping locally reduces holiday waste impact? Like, how does that work? Yeah, and also I think it's important to note that it gives back to our community when you shop locally. So when we think about, you know, doing right by people and planet, you know, thinking locally and looking to your local community first is always going to be the best option. Um, But there are tons of local resources, places um, that you can go to buy uh, thoughtful, meaningful, useful gifts that are locally made and locally procured. Um, And also thinking about, like I said, about the experiences and things around the state. There's just so many great things to do. Um, And, you know, spending time outdoors is is a great way to, um, and I love the idea of spending time volunteering in a a food kitchen or something like that. Um, You know, but also supporting local organizations through giving gift cards to local restaurants or um, I, I think as Brittany was talking, I was thinking, how awesome would it be um, to maybe buy someone uh, a CSA for the season and then also buy one for a local family that maybe would really need that? Um, and shout out to Forest City Farm for um, their CSA that I often rely on. So, yeah. And so uh, we only have a minute here left. I want to ask Yasmin, you know, for our listeners who hope to do all of the things that we've talked about today, do you have any advice or places to go that they can learn more on how to do these things? Well, definitely Reboot Eco. <laughs> you can definitely come in, find out how you can use what you already have, uh, get things that are reusable, can really have an impact on uh, uh, the recipient, but just shop local. You know, going, to, so it's not just us, any of these small businesses, the people working there, they really can, you know, they help, they know, they've got an idea, they understand the products, they understand the, the businesses, they know the people making these these products. So just really make an effort uh, to, to shop local. It doesn't have to be more expensive, right? You're looking at, you know, these prices online and the convenience. And just really reducing the stress around the holiday and reducing your, the expectations you have of yourself will allow you a little bit more of the mental capacity to make better decisions, right? It really might just take a little bit of extra thinking and preparation, uh, but then it really has a longer lasting impact and you'll feel better about it. The gift recipient will feel better about it and the ripple effects really are uh, significant. Well, thanks for uh, helping us continue that ripple effect today. Uh, you've been listening to Yasmin Ugalu, who is the founder and owner of Reboot Eco, which is a zero-waste shop in Middletown, Connecticut, and also Mariah Kelly, who's an assistant professor of environmental science from Southern Connecticut State University. Thank you both so much for joining us this hour and giving us so many amazing tips for the holidays. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. And happy holidays, everyone. Okay. Happy holidays to the both of you. And also a quick invitation to our listeners. Do you like politics? If so, our friends at The Wheelhouse want to meet you. Join host Frankie Graziano for a live taping of The Wheelhouse on Wednesday, December 6th. He'll be joined by a powerhouse panel that will look back on the year in politics in Connecticut and beyond. So get your tickets today at ctpublic.org slash Frankie. That's F-R-A-N-K-I-E. I'm Catherine Shen. Today's show is produced by Tess Terrible. Our technical producer is Kat Pastor. Download where we live anytime on your favorite podcast app. Happy holidays to all of our listeners. And thank you always for listening. 